The Sign Institute of Policy and Politics is American University's incubator for policy innovation. We convene leaders in the academic, public, private, nonprofit, and journalism sectors to engage and promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions. In an evolving world, we seize the opportunity to work on the nation's most pressing challenges through collaboration by experts and top scholars in their field with students in research and scholarship. As part of that goal, the Sign Institute leverages American University's location in our nation's capital, the nexus of government and a growing international business center. We connect diverse perspectives from around the country and around the world with our world-class academics and research, experienced practitioners, and the most politically active student body in the U.S. We stand apart through our focus on the role of business and the nonprofit community in public policy the rise of the importance of economic regions in the United States, and international policy issues. Our focus is to make an immediate impact at the intersection of policy and politics that leads to real and lasting change. Thank you for joining us as we convene, communicate, and collaborate. And now introducing 2023 Sign Fellow, Terrence Samuel. That's how it always works. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're really excited to welcome you here today to today's Sign Seminar. My name is Benjamin Bryant. I'm the Communications Director for the Sign Institute. On behalf of the Institute and my colleagues, I'm really happy to be looking at such a large, enthusiastic crowd today, so that's great. Uh, big thanks to all of you who have come out today. The Sign Institute <clears throat> is a laboratory for university-wide collaboration and it's an incubator for policy innovation, convening the best and brightest in the public, private, academic, and nonprofit sectors, as well as journalism. As we say, sign is where the brightest minds engage to promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions. And it's where American University comes to convene, communicate, and collaborate. Today, we are honored to have sign fellow Terrence Samuel with us for his second seminar along with his featured guests, Andrew McDaniels, and we have Wesley Lowry coming soon. Terrence serves as vice president and executive editor at NPR, where he oversees all news gathering for the broadcast network. He is also the author of the 2010 book, The Upper House, A Journey Behind the Closed Doors of the United States Senate. Andrew McDaniels serves as the managing editor of the Baltimore Banner and is a journalist with 25 years of experience reporting in large markets. She specializes in opinion writing and on subject matters that include medicine and health, racial and social justice, and business issues. Welcome, Andrea. So to be joining Terrence and Andrew today is Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, reporter, editor, and best-selling author, Wesley Lowry. Wesley is currently a journalist in residence at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at City University of New York, or CUNY, uh, a contributing editor at the Marshall Project, and the host of a podcast. Wesley is known for his written, audio, and on-camera work, and is widely regarded as one of the nation's leading journalists covering issues of law enforcement, race, and justice. Terrence and his guests have joined us on campus today to continue the conversation on news deserts and disinformation, and how the crisis in local news is destabilizing global democracy. So everybody, please welcome Terrence Samuel, Andrew McDaniels, and when you rise, Wesley Lowry. That's why I wasn't here for all that. <laughs> all those nice things being said about it. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this issue is really, really important to me, and I feel that by looking at this crowd, it's important to you as well. Um, so you've heard, you've heard all the bad news. Um, oh, dear, your twenty-one hundred. Your guest is here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yay. You should have heard all the nice things they said about you. I, no, that's why I didn't. That's why I wasn't here. So you'd be nice for them. As I was saying, um, so as as has been mentioned, this is the second in in the series, and the at the first one we talked a lot about kind of the problems 
involved in local lives. The and the, the numbers are what they are, and they're bad. Um, Twenty one hundred newspapers vanished over the last decade and a half. Eighteen hundred communities across the country with no local newsroom. Um, Sixty percent of journalists who had jobs in two thousand no longer have them. Um, and we keep adding to that by the day, including today. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's a bad story that uh, seems to be getting worse. And um, I think what we're here to do today is to talk a little bit about kind of the problem and some of the solutions. You know, my theory about journalism is, and I had an editor who once said that, that the way you write a lead the way you, is that you find the emotional heart of the story. I think, and th that kind of changes the texture of, of how you think about stories. If, if you're looking for the emotional heart of the story, it's, it's essentially then a story about probably a person, probably a place. And if we focus on that, then every story is local. Um, and I think, the two people we have here are some of the great practitioners in telling big, important stories through individual people. At it. And so you have some of the best in terms of local reporting um, anywhere. Um, Andrea, as you've heard, has been in Baltimore for 20 years, first at the Baltimore Sun. Um, and that's good. this is going to be a big part of the story. The Baltimore Sun was a behemoth. When I was in college, the thing that the Baltimore Sun was famous for in my mind was that they had a London correspondent. Um, the Sun, like a lot of papers, including the ones I worked for in Philadelphia and St. Louis, um, were there more? <laughs> the Roanoke Times, my first newspaper, those papers were monopolies, not just in terms of business, but in terms of community. That they were part of that community and in some ways held it together. And as those papers declined and disappeared, we saw kind of almost the exact result uh, in, in terms of community. Wes did work at some of the same places, the Boston Globe, the LA Times, the Washington Post, uh, and managed to do local stories at the national level in a way that you will hear um, really impacted the way we think about um, a lot of the important issues. So what I'm gonna do first is ask, I'm gonna to turn to Andrea first, but talk a little bit about having worked at the Baltimore Sun and what that was like, and then now being the managing editor at the Baltimore Banner, which is uh, in some ways the, the counter argument to what's happening in a lot of cities and what it's like to just be somebody with impact in local communities because of reporting and journalism. Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Is this working? I can't tell. Okay. So I worked at the Sun for 20 years. Um, I came as a 20 something year reporter, excited about journalism, digging into big stories, et cetera. When I started at the Sun, there were 400 people in the newsroom. I started on the business desk. There were like 20 something editors, I mean, 20 something reporters, three editors, a night business editor. By the time I left, uh, last year, there were fewer than 100 people in the newsroom. We had bureaus, um, Mexico Bureau, you mentioned London Bureau, huge DC office. So while, while I was there, I just watched the journalism decline. I watched the staff numbers drop. Um, and the impact that it had was uh, we were covering fewer communities. Um, we weren't, you know, digging into the communities. We became more reactive instead of proactive. So we were covering institutions, we were covering you know government agencies, but it was from a very re reactive reproach. I mean, we're less and less proactive. 
um, and digging up stories. Um, that's not to say that we didn't have good journalists there and journalists who cared and, you know, we're trying because I should say we did win a Pulitzer for government work, um, which was kind of remarkable given the staff that we had, but um, it, it just kept getting smaller and smaller. Um, and the final thing for me was when the hedge fund became the majority owner and the hedge fund out. And if you look at what was happening around the country, um, you know, the writing was on the wall. They come in, they strip you of all the assets, uh, they fire as many people as they can, um, and they don't care about the journalism. It was very clear it was all about numbers, 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 numbers. Um, so when they offered a buyout, I was like, okay, you know, I'll take the money. Um, and I'll see what else I can do in life. It's kind of scary after being there 20 years. Um, so, and I went to the, what some people call, well, I won't call it the dark side because you guys <laughs> are going into communications in here, but I did go go work for Johns Hopkins for three months um, doing uh, communications work. And then um, somebody from the banner called. And at first I was like, I'm, I think I'm just done with journalism. I don't know where it's going, but talking to the CEO, I got inspired again because they're really trying to find a solution for local journalism. They really believed in the importance of it. Um, and they're trying to find a financial solution to keep local journalism going. Um, and the solution that we see, I mean, first you have to have a good revenue model. Because at, at the end of the day, if you can't make money from it, from it you can't keep going. You can write all the best stories in the world, but if you don't have the money to keep it going, if you don't have the money to pay people, um, it, you know, it doesn't matter. So. What attracted to me to it was the revenue model, which is probably boring to people um, <laughs> who write, but it's important. Not this um, right, Okay, good, good. <laughs> so, so the re our revenue model is advertising, philanthropy, events, um, and subscriptions. So it's a diversified, diversified business model, um, and we are also focused on local, 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 local. Um, at first we didn't even have AC, but then we realized, okay, we do. In AP, <laughs> we can't not cover some some big stories like if, if Jimmy Carter passes, we need to have that in our paper. So you know, so there are some exceptions to our local local coverage. Um, but you need local coverage because if you don't have local coverage, things will happen in your community, and when it happens, it'll be too late. So you need those journalists out there uncovering those stories and not just doing it from a reactionary perspective. You know, um, what's happening in the city council. <laughs> By the time it's there, it's too late. And I can give you one of our big missions at the banner is impact. We even have an impact page on our website where we tell the community what the impact of our journalism has been. We have an impact Slack channel. So when um, you know our, our stories have impact in the community, people put it in the Slack channel. And it can be big impact, but it can also be like small community impact. Like we have two neighborhood reporters, um, which the son got rid of like years ago. I would like more actually because neighborhoods are microcosms of what happens at a large level, at a larger level in the cities. And that's where you first start seeing things happen, the end that's spreading in the cities. So we saw that as very important. Um, so it can be a little stuff like this community had had all these accidents on Orleans Street in Baltimore and nobody paid attention. Are, are they been complaining and complaining? Um, our neighborhood reporter went and wrote the story went and got data on all the on, on, on all the accidents, wrote the story. And now the Department of Transportation is doing um, an impact study. And then after the impact study will come solutions for how to you know, improve the traffic. Yeah. So there's a, we're gonna come back to a lot sure, of sure, this. Sure. Okay. A lot of this. Um, but let me jump to Wes, who, okay, so when, Wes, when did you come to the post? 2014? 14. The only thing I knew about him was that he was the guy in the, he was the guy who found the Boston Marathon bomber in the, in the boat because there are cops running around everywhere in Boston looking for people. And what does he do? He goes out and hangs out to dangerous places. So talk a little bit about how that kind of local reporting um shape the kind of work you did later sure um so the first two you know my first two jobs out of college were at los angeles times and the boston globe 
And in both of those cases, I was trying to, uh, one, like figure out how to be an adult and <laughs> work in a newsroom and pay bills and, you know, how long I can wait till my student loans are due. Like that, kind of, all, all that was involved, right? Um, but second, in those cases was working for, for Metro Desk and was trying to think about and figure out how do I, as someone who is new, someone who is not from here initially in either one of these cities, how do I acclimate to a space that is not my own and how do I do journalism that is important and impactful, um, but that is also sensitive and thoughtful and I don't look like an idiot, right? It's the collective aim. Um, and, and so a, a big part of that for me and, and it helped that, you know, I've got a little bit of obsessive, you know, I can be a little obsessive, so I really care about something or I'm interested in something. I, you know, it's the only thing I'm thinking, you know, and so I'm reading, Just a little bit. So I'm reading all the books. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out these places where I live, right? Um, and again, I was 21, 22, I didn't have a life. So I just lived at work and, and did that. And, and so I, but, but there was something that was really important about it. I think the first thing was, you know, when I worked at the LA Times, um, I was there for about six months and I was doing rotations. And so I was at the Metro Desk for two months and in the City Hall Bureau for two months and I covered entertainment for two months. It was still like the most fun two months I've ever had. Um, and I was a big organization in this big city uh, that itself was dealing with cutbacks at the time. Uh, the LA Times was owned by Tribune before it became Trump, while it was still bankrupt, I think, so we were waiting to emerge from bankruptcy, and um, still a big, formidable newsroom, but not um, certainly not what the LA Times had once been. Um, and Los Angeles is one of the biggest, most complex, diverse, complicated metro metropolises in the world, uh, much less in the country, right? And so very quickly, I was, I was seeing how these stories that I would cover, even just in the small metro ways, how truly very often, if I didn't write it down, no one was going to cover these stories or write about them. I was just thinking about yesterday, how I had had a, um, I worked for a while for a project called Homicide Report at the LA Times that a uh, journalist named Julie Ovi started, where she started a project where the LA Times would write about every single homicide victim in LA County. Um, under the pretense, um, but, but the argument being that um, without that, the vast majority of people who, whose life is taken are taken by someone else in a county like LA never are written about. There's never any journalistic scrutiny, nothing ever happens. Um, and so I, for a while, worked for that project, um, which also included many of the police shootings at the time or, or, or police killings because they would come up with homicide. And so uh, one of the first big stories I ever worked on was the story of a man, Jose De La Trinidad, who'd been killed by LA County Sheriff's deputies. Um, and again, I was not any special reporter um, at all, um, but truly was the only one writing about this case. And ultimately we located a witness who contracted what the police said and um, you know, the family ended up being paid millions of dollars um, because the officers had lied about what happened um, that day. And I just say it to say, again, I, I haven't, I actually, I want to go back and reread those pieces. I'm sure I, I hate them now. And <laughs> I, I, I'm sure I would do a much better job today. Uh, but, but it was a lesson very early on how even in a big place with lots of media, there are a lot of stories that aren't being told and there's space to carve out and find a way to do that. What was also true in those cases was that there are communities, entire swaths of community who just weren't used to being covered by these big organizations or these big places. Um, you know, their four or five local TV channels had written about Jose's death and no one had called his, his widow. And so then I did, and we talked. Um, and so I got invited to the funeral. And then and you just see how our job is relationship building. And that so often people are coming in to these relationships uh, having a, a negative relationship or no relationship whatsoever with the media because the media doesn't exist or come or spend time where they are. Um, by the time I got to Boston, I, one, had, was coming off of these experiences in LA, but two, knew I was going to a place that was, you know, perhaps not as diverse, maybe a little bit more parochial, right? You know, I, I was just very aware of what I was going into, you know, in Boston, I was going to the Globe to cover local politics and I, and Boston and Massachusetts have a very, healthy local press corps and so i knew i was like the odd man like i was this new guy coming in getting a job everyone kind of wanted um and and so i made it a mission of mine 
to have it be that people could say whatever they wanted to say about me, but they couldn't say that anyone worked harder than I did, um, and or that anyone else wasn't as committed to understanding the things I didn't know. Unlike a lot of my friends and colleagues, no, I hadn't gone to high school with the with the state legislators who we covered. I didn't know all the local references. I hadn't lived in this neighborhood forever, right? But I would go to the community meeting that no one else would go to. Um, and whether or not it was my job, to, whether or not I was writing about it for the newspaper or not, if I was interested in something or I needed to get to know something or something was going to be part of my beat or adjacent to it, I took it on myself to make sure to show up and be in those spaces. And in a very short amount of time, uh, that really paid off in a lot of different ways. Uh, one, as a reporter, you, you want to gain a reputation to be that type of person, right? Um, I always say, if someone wants to give me information, I don't want to make it particularly difficult for them to find me or locate me, right? In order to do that, I need to be there and around and talking to people and interacting. Um, but, but secondarily, what I also think is true, and some of the great uh, journalistic stories of our times come from these, this type of thing is very often the best journalism is done when you apply an outsider set of eyes to something that's always been there and that was always existed. Right, that the very thing I was worried about being my weakness was actually one of my strengths in this case because I didn't know anything. And so I'd ask people questions. I'd go, oh, that's interesting. And I'd write down the things they said. Um, and I think that sometimes our inclination, all, and all of us have it, to kind of be know it alls. Right? When someone says, oh, did you see that movie? And you didn't even hear the movie they said, you just say, oh, yeah, I saw it. Right. Because you don't ever want to go, wait, what are you talking about? I've never heard of that before. Right. Often as journalists, like that, that's the thing that gets in our way. We should, if we're going to lie to people politely, we should lie in the opposite direction. So you can, both of you guys have mentioned something interesting, which is this idea of um, covering stories that no one else does. Um, so a lot of what we're talking about here in this seminar is kind of the, the loss of um, loss, loss of local news sources and kind of the ramifications of that on communities. Uh, but in listening to you, it sounds like, that sounds like I know this to be a fact, that even these big institutions in their heyday, in some ways didn't cover um, some parts of, of those communities in a way that, that they should have. And those communities suffered the consequences even then. Um, I mean, you've both done a lot on race. Um, in fact, you, AJ, I think when you left the sun, you wrote about um, this one particular thing you had done, much I forgot. It was about a woman who had set up a program to help, and I forgot who. I don't remember. <laughs> Um, but, but you spend a lot of time talking to regular people in Baltimore. I mean, you didn't do the stories about the accidents on X Street, but that's the kind of reporting that allows you to like live in people's skin, so to speak. Right. And, and that's, that's also the kind of reporting when you get the real stories. You're not just getting talking heads, you're getting how things are impacting real people. Um, and I think those are um, the most important stories. And you're, and you're right, a lot of the big institutions even back in the day didn't do a good job of it. And as uh, staff shrunk, the first thing they got rid of was those reporters. They didn't see that as important. So part of our mission at the banner is in our mission was, is to cover communities that have typically not been covered. Um, and to always try, you know, of crime stories to always try to talk to people in the neighborhoods to talk to people impacted by the crimes. And when I, was at the, when I was at the Sun, I did a series of stories on how violence impacts real people from a trauma perspective. Because when you are constantly in fear of your life, that impacts your health and um, your mental health, not just your mental health, but your physical health too. So it's, you know, so that is part of our mission to get to cover these communities. And we can see it in our numbers. I mean, not just in neighborhood reporting, but even in like, there's certain counties that weren't covered. And you see when we do these stories, our numbers go way up because there's a dearth of news coverage in a lot of these areas. Um, and people want that coverage. They, you know, they want to want to go, want to know what's going on. And then you can take that all the way to a, a business impact. We need these readers. <laughs> we need these subscribers 
you know, to survive. So, you know, it's a holistic impact when you do that kind of coverage. When I was at the, when I was at the post, you know, I started covering politics and then shifted over and was a national correspondent um, covering <laughs> other stuff. Yeah, yeah terrible yes. editor. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and I, for years, my job would be to drop into cities where, you know, very often there had been some type of um, extremely traumatic racial incident. Typically, the cops had killed someone, but there were plenty of other ones as well. And in journalism, especially at the beginning, especially 2014, 2015, there was this big internal industry conversation about the local reporting versus the national reporting and parachuting and this and that. And isn't this the job for local reporters to do this? And should we be deferential to them and X, Y, and Z? And there's a level of performative deference there in part because most national reporters were local reporters once and you all remember the assholes showing up in our city and you know like, and, um but but what was also true was that when i dropped into st louis it would be nice if a local reporter at the st louis post dispatch or x y and z was better positioned to tell the story and had better relationships with these communities the newspaper couldn't have found Ferguson, Missouri on a map before I showed up. <laughs> and if they did, it was to write something racist and dumb, right? That, that so often I would show up in, in, in organizations and, or show up in neighborhoods and people would go, thank God, not, not our terrible local press. Someone from the outside is going to give us a fair shake, is going to listen to what we're talking about and, and isn't, you know, it's so, again, that's not to disparage full organizations or, or, you know, there are great journalists working in every market, right? But what's also true is that local news organizations are local institutions. And so if there are local problems happening, those institutions have been either party to those problems or opposition to those problems, right? An example I always give is that, you know, there's a great front page piece that was done. I remember it was, I was I, in Ferguson about three, four months and, and they did a great piece about all the diversity and all the local uh, police departments at X, Y, and Z, and it would have been a great piece to do before Michael Brown was dead in the street, but they didn't. And so I think that one of the things, we, one of the unfortunate realities, one that we don't want to be true, is that so often, you know, and this kind of gets to the premise of Terry's question, is that it's not simply enough to get us back to what once was, because we had massive communities that were deeply underserved by our local press when it was at its most robust. Uh, I, I live in, I, uh, I grew up in Cleveland, my parents live in Cleveland. And at one point, the, the, uh, the, the, there was a new round of cuts happening at the Cleveland Plain Dealer, our, our local paper, and the, some of the Save the Plain Dealer uh, reporters came together and they tried to get a group of black ministers to sign on their petition, the minister says, well, the minister said, well, you don't cover us anyway, so who cares if we save the plane dealer? And they had a point. I don't know anybody who reads the plane dealer, not where I'm from. And so I, I think that there is a, I think we have to hold two things, right? It's great for us to be journalistic romantics. And I 100% want a world where we have a robust, healthy journalism ecosystem and where all our communities are. But as we build new local institutions, like, like folks are doing at the banner and elsewhere, right? We have to not repeat the same problems that uh, were created by the last version of this. So, so my, my better question is, does that lack of service, that um, kind of deficient reporting in those black, poor, particular uncovered marginalized community, does that tell us anything about where we are now and if we can recover from it? Well, even at the banner, we say one of the good things is because we're new, we don't have the baggage of the old institutions, but there still is trust building because there are a lot of communities that don't trust media, period. They just see media as the one big thing and they don't trust media. Period. So we are having to prove ourselves, you know, a little bit with stories, but it isn't taking that much because we are even the little bit that you know, even the little bit you do is more that's been done. And I can give one example, like we have our neighborhood report has been covering this neighborhood called Edmonton Village. So then um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a kid was killed from the high school 
at Edmonton Village, at the Edmonton Village Shopping Center that she had been writing about. So because she had been writing about that, she had those connections in the community and was able to do a story about how the, how the community felt when nobody in the city had been covering it at the village. So, so it, it does pay off, but there is some trust building. And some of what we've discovered too is that getting people to care about Love Wonders again is still, is still a fight, even though we're getting a lot of new readers. A lot of people don't care as much about local news and I guess have forgotten the impact that it can have on them. So there is so there is some building even at a new publication. But I do think we have the benefit of not having the baggage of whole institutions. How much of that? I mean, my sense is that people do care about local news. That's 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 their life. Some they, people they yeah. just don't expect to get it from these institutions. Well I think there's a few things. I think that I think the first is that I think we may have all always overestimated how much anyone cares about any news because <laughs> right. we obviously care yeah. a lot, yeah. right? Yes. For while well, like the average person walking on the street cares about like that there's food on their table and that their kids are healthy and safe. And that, like, and, like the news right. is adjacent to those things, yes. but the most important thing to them today has literally nothing to do with the news. Right. right? But what I also and I say that to say as I think about it, right? We remember the old local, local news model and, and, and when the subscriber rates used to be what they once were, it was not, it was lovely to believe that it was because people really cared about our coverage of the city council. The reason people subscribe to newspapers is because we delivered the internet to their doorstep every day. Right. If you wanted to know if the Yankees won their game yesterday and how many games behind them the Red Sox are, if you wanted to know the weather next week and whether you should wear a jacket on Tuesday, if you wanted to buy a car or sell your house or get, uh, you, you know, or find a sex worker or laugh and read the comics or like literally we delivered the entire internet on pieces of paper to your house every day. That is what people subscribe to. It was, it was a full representation of all the things you needed in life. Correct. Yeah. It was useful, including the coupons. And so now <laughs> high school football is yes. probably the oh, thing. And so now think about it. What do you what do you need to subscribe to a newspaper for? I can get all those things in five seconds. Right? What do I need to? And so when I think we have to think about it, doing some work with the Marshall Project, criminal justice news organization, and helping them to launch a newsroom in Cleveland and, and some other kind of other places. And we've spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about, and I think there's been a lot of conversation in local news spaces about this. What does it mean to service organization? Like the solution is not to create a New Yorker in all these poor neighborhoods. And the reason is, so in Cleveland, for example, the, Cleveland has a literacy rate of 27%. So okay. if our job, our goal is to go in and service this community, write a little bunch of 10,000 word articles people cannot read is a useless means of doing that, right? Yes. It's journalism we're doing for ourselves and our friends, right? And so part of what we have to think about as we think about local news and its future is what does it mean for us to actually be essential parts of people's lives? And some of that will mean writing articles like we've always written articles, but that might not actually be our chief journalistic function, right? The, if I'm actually you'd be only one writing 10,000 for her. Well, these days, right? <laughs> but you know, I, it, it, so it's like we have to think about that. Um, it's, it's, so I think we have to think about that as well. You know, how do we make sure that we are essential in people's lives in a way we once were, and being essential today is going to look different than it did in 1997 because the internet does exist. And, and second, what is it that our community, if I'm working for a newspaper that covers the District of Columbia, one of the most, especially if I'm, if I'm covering Southeast, or one of the most essential things might be about, in the last few years, where to get vaccinated, or X, Y, and Z. Like, can someone come to, my, come to my news organization and actually receive that information, the, the vital information? For them? Or are they receiving my too long article about some esoteric thing, right? And I think that's something we have to think about. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it goes back to my, my usefulness doctrine. At the end of the day, we have to be useful. And that looks different in different places. The thing about the newspaper was that there was a bunch of stuff. And if you didn't find something on the front page, you could find it in Metro or you could find it in... Part of what is necessary, though, is that you can't sit at 13 and K and write about what you think is happening in Southeast. 
you have to be part of that community and care about the same things and hear what people are concerned about, what they're worried about, what they're dreaming about. Uh, and that's how you cover it. I mean, that's how you cover a beat. You, you, you go live it. Um, and um, I think in part because of the models we have, there are fewer and fewer people starting out that way. You know, they literally start out by covering Congress, which is, you know, it's, it's almost like science fiction to, to cover that. But well, but I also want to think about and also, what matters? Who do you perceive your reader to be? Who do you perceive your community? Not to pick on our friends at the Post, right? But there's a genocide happening in Ethiopia right now. We live in the city with the most Ethiopians of any place outside of this, outside of Ethiopia. And I've read not a single article about what Ethiopia, what about Habesha people in D.C. feel about the literal slaughter of their family members. And we are here in one of the media capitals of the entire Western world with a newspaper owned by the third richest man in the world. They could have sent somebody to interview somebody one time, but they didn't. Yeah, my Uber driver was Ethiopian today, and um, boy, did I hear about it. Um, but um, so I actually didn't know that LA Times Trinidad story. Um, but the, the, the big story he did at the Post with a bunch of other people on the fatal force. Mm -hmm. That was local reporting that looked like something else, uh, looked like a big Post Pulitzer Prize winning series. But talk a little bit about how it seems that that came about because of kind of your beginnings on, in Los Angeles. Sure. I, I think that. I think that one of the things that's important, one of the things that's true, and some of this comes from just my own lived experience, but frankly, it could come just directly from my journalistic experience, is that I think that, unfortunately, and some of this is because of the hollowing out of our newsrooms, but a big part of it, frankly, is also that um, we, we've gotten ourselves, in a lot of cases, out of the habit and out of giving ourselves the time and resource to do it is that too much of what we consider journalism today really is just the, the recording of things that powerful people say without actually any in, in journalistic interrogation. And, and so what we see time and time again, we see this in the law enforcement space all the time, is that the police announce that something has happened and no one actually asks them if, if that's really what happened. And, and so when we went out to Ferguson, we were having this massive national conversation about the police killing black people and was it happening too often and was it happening at all? And the police would say, of course, it's not happening. And the activists would say it's happening every day. And we would earnestly write these stories up, quoting everybody accurately. But it felt as if we had a journalistic obligation to get to the bottom of that question, right? Either the police were killing black people in the streets every day or they were not, right? There actually isn't a debate. It's a, there's a fact there one way or the other. And we were surprised to find that, that 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 information wasn't available, so we went and created it ourselves. But it's it, so ultimately what ended up happening is we ended up applying journalistic pressure to what were a ton of local stories. Um, I two years later, two years after that, we did a project called Murder with Impunity, where we looked at unsolved homicides across major cities and and neighborhoods where homicides are never solved, and how that erodes the relationships. And one thing that was remarkable to me was you know, reviewing 65,000 homicides in major American cities, was the, the reality is the average kid killed in Chicago today, there will never be a piece of journalism about that kid, about why they were murdered, about what happened, about whether or not the person who murdered them is arrested or goes to prison. Uh, my great-grandfather was murdered in Denver, North Carolina in 1931, and, I, and there is coverage of the trial in the local paper. That is not true. Today in Washington, D.C., of the average murder case, right? And so I, I, I do think that, and, mur and that's the like big sexy stuff, right? That's true crime and it's cops and courts. And, I mean, that's not the difficulty of community reporting. I mean, this is like the easy stuff. And so I think that there's a lot to be said for, you know, time and time again, as we spent time on these projects, 
seeing the gaps that had been left. Um, and, and what happens, again, it's not even that people distrust us, that in a lot of places, people just don't even have relationships with us. And what does our public record lose when we don't take the time to collect that information and write it down? Um, Andrew, you covered medicine and health in Baltimore, mm -hmm. which meant that you covered the big institution of Johns Hopkins, um, which is a huge deal. It's also local reporting. How did that lead to kind of the big story about trauma and race that you ended up doing? So actually that story came about because I asked the question, what about gunshots and violence are we not covering? And when I asked that question, the answer I came up with, we're not covering what's happening in the communities. So then you start asking the question, how is it impacting the communities? Um, and that came from talking to people on the ground from the community groups. So not the police, like I did, actually I did very little talking to the police on this story. When I did try to talk to them, I had a hard time because, and, and I take it as because they never thought it, they don't think about it from that perspective. Yeah. So I could really, no, really never get a good interview with them. So that's really how I came to that story. So I think it's always like, let's talk about what's not being covered because there's a lot that's not being covered. And then you talked a little bit about um, not always taking place forward because journalists can be reactive in the moment, I think. And even at a place like the banner where we're trying not to do that, um, last week there is a 20 something year old who his father called police because he was in mental, mental crisis. The police got there, he shot at the police, shot at his father and fled, fled for, fled for like two days, was on, on the loose for two days, um, killed another cop, uh, ran to the woods in a county, one county over, was like, when we're listening to this scanner, he's rolling in the dirt so he couldn't be detected, like, you know, yelling all kinds of stuff. And at the end of the day, the police said this, um, it was a peaceful ending. And so there was a debate about how is this peaceful? He, you know, he shot two cops, he ran for two days, he didn't even surrender at the end. They had to like talk, you know, talk them back. So it does all go back to how we're covering things, what questions we're asking, and not just taking, you know, the award of officials and authorities and actually um, question, you know, questioning the, the narrative that they're putting up. Uh, they're making sure we're acting in the drama. So I mean, it seems like a story that is a clearly disturbed. I don't know. The right. reporting, the reporting, bear that out. But, um, but it wasn't peaceful. Just on, <laughs> yeah. just, yeah. Just on a personal level, what you want to know is what was going on with that guy. Because yes. you know what's going on with the cops, and yes. you, you don't even blame them. But the story is right. what is going on with that guy. Right. Um, um, I also wonder if that guy would agree it was peaceful. Right. He <laughs> shot how many cops? Did you tell me they didn't rough him up? Yeah. There's, no. yeah. The cops come out and yeah. announce it, like, don't worry, we got him. It was There's fine. This, it was yeah. a peaceful apprehension. I'm sure that guy's got a black eye. Right. right? right. And right. our job is to call that guy and ask him. And so we don't very often. Yeah. Well, in this case, I don't think people always let him talk, but yes, you're right. Let him talk, but yes. So we want to leave a little time for questions, but I would like to do this before we get there. Um, the banner is part of this kind of growth industry of um, nonprofit news startups. Um, there are all kinds of different models. Uh, some people are really, really optimistic and excited about them. Talk a little bit about why you think um, there is reason for optimism and seems to you if that is in fact yeah. how you feel. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I wouldn't have come back if I wasn't. Um, I think the good thing about nonprofit is you're not emboldened to shareholders, you're not emboldened to uh, people trying to make money. All the money goes back, you know, into the business. You're spending more resources on the journalism and that, and that other factors. Um, we're actually looking for a financial model that works. 
um, and paying attention to the numbers, paying attention that work um, at what works. Um, also, as a startup, we part of our it's not really part of our mission, but we want to be nimble. So when we see things aren't working, we can move quickly and try something else. I think at a lot of um, institutions, everybody's scared to try something new. Or I always heard. I remember a columnist said it once told, told me, this is the way I've always done it. I've been at like this for 27 years. I was like, yeah, which <laughs> means you shouldn't be doing, doing it this way anymore. Um, I don't know. So that that's what gives me hope and that we're trying to do journalism in a different way, paying attention to what readers want um, to, like you said, what's useful to readers, you know, constantly surveying readers, constantly asking, you know, you know, you know, what do you want? So I think there's, a, I think there's a lot of hope. Yeah, there's actually more hope than I've ever felt in my career. Trying, trying to, to serve the reader rather than uh, impress your colleagues is, right. um, yes. A, yes. it's a tough hill to climb in this business. Yes. Uh, how about you, Les? Certainly. I mean, I think that that, you know, I, I'm really excited about the growth of nonprofit journalism. I mean, I, I think that, it, I mean, it's important to note that, you know, we still are beholden to somebody. The rich people do are the ones who cut the checks and yes. <laughs> they have plenty of ideas about, and, and look, it's very nice that currently all the rich people who fund journalism like the same things I like, but that could change. <laughs> Right. Um, and and what happens when we have 100 rich people who want to fund climate journalism and no one who wants to fund covering the city council? And I think that that, you know, and so but I will say it, it is a model that is much more in line with the ethos of journalism as a public service. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is, as a capitalistic enterprise, it, it's, it's been a miserable outcome for us. Mm -hmm. um, we turn on television that news that doesn't inform us of things. And we um, have watched uh, news organizations have to abandon a lot of the rigor of, of reporting to try to match the speed of the internet um, and capture online advertisement dollars. And then we've watched as what used to be family owned newspapers become family owned change and then become publicly owned chains where uh, we, I mean, we've just watched American capitalism destroy these institutions. And then privately held by hedge fund managers. Exactly, you know, because they're, because they're, because journalism is a field that has to do journalism like any public utility, you have to have redundancies. You have to employ that guy in the corner who knows nothing about anything but earthquakes. Why? Because one day there's going to be an earthquake. And it's the job of the Los Angeles Times to be able to definitively help the city get through the earthquakes. And so even though that guy, like economically on a spreadsheet, not that useful to you, your job <laughs> as a public as a public good is to employ that person, right? Is to have redundancies, is to have two or three reporters on a story and to follow up on it more than once, right? It's not a field that can work with that type of efficiency. And we've watched over and over again, our news organizations get destroyed once they go public and there's a fiduci fiduciary responsibility to shareholders where their actual literal job is to make as much money as possible. Um, and we, we've seen that. And so, uh, no, I do, I do really like a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of friends who are working in nonprofit news right now, local and national. I think there's a ton of growth and space there. I think we're asking a lot of the right questions. Who are we servicing? What's the point of doing this? How do we not inherit all the mistakes of the past and, and bring them with us into the future? Um, but that said, it, it is, uh, you know, it's complicated. And if we hit a, and I, I lose sleep sometimes thinking about what happens when we hit a recession and Craig Newmark of Craigslist stops funding everybody, right? The, the reality is like, there are like seven rich families who fund 40% of American journalism right now. If the Knights decide they don't care anymore, there's no more journalism in America. That's not really a great spot for us to be in. <laughs> no. um, Which is why you don't depend entirely on land. Of course. Yeah. 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 But you're right. Yeah. I give him credit. He really tried to be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> and I talked myself out of it, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he ended up where he ended up. Um, so the reason I'm optimistic is I think the idea of philanthropy journalism is spreading a little deeper into kind of uh, regular people. It's it's not just the richest people in the world. And I think that's going to save us. That's one. Even 
bigger than that, the people coming into the business are really smart and really committed and have great ideas about how to do things that are better and different and mind blowing than, than the ones we had. So there's that. Um, all right, questions. This is now your show. Um, my friends over here, my student associates have a whole list of questions and I'm gonna give you guys the right to start. So who wants to go? Alyssa. Hi, um, my name is Alyssa, I'm a first year. Um, my question is for you, Lindsay Gaines. Um, you spoke about your work, um, like studying violence, um, like in that series. Um, and I was kind of reading about it, how it was award winning, how much of it was so individualized, and how you had to talk specifically to different, it was like microcosms of the, the community. And I was wondering how the process and also the result might have looked if it was something that was done through the processes of a large news organization rather than done locally. Actually, I did do that when I was at, when I was at the Sun. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so it's a large still then. Right. But, but I can say it was, it was difficult because I still, it's not like they gave me six months just to do it. Like a lot of it, I was doing it on the side. Um, towards the end, I got a little more focused time, but, but a lot of those times, if you're not on the investigative team, those stories aren't under priority and because our staff was so had gotten so small it wasn't a priority so so i can tell you that i did face those obstacles Absolutely. Yeah. but when you get a good story you know you can you can convince your editors yeah to do it because they did bring in an editor once they realized what the story was they brought in an, an editor from the outside to edit and kind of focus on it in those last weeks so that was good thank you Sarah, and then anybody. Hello, my name is Sarah. I'm a current freshman. Before I even start, I want to thank each of you for taking time to speak with us today. It was a really insightful discussion. My question is pertaining to access regarding local news. As mentioned earlier, especially in communities that fall in the low income communities, it's often very difficult for individuals to be able to have access to local news regarding whether the access to technology or literacy rates, which can make access to local news difficult. So what are ways that we can alter the local news industry in order to make providing information more accessible within these areas? Oh, I, can, I can start. So, so we've had actually had a lot of discussion with, about that at the banner because we're all digital. And some people argue that, you know, not everybody can have digital access, but most people get their news by phone now. So I kind of disagree with that. And most people even, most people have a phone. Um, but we have played around with, like we made sure we, people could get to the library, made sure people could get to their schools. And we had them playing a, around with, and I don't think they quite figured it out on how we could have provide free access to certain zip codes. That's something that we're kind of like playing around with on how it's just been hard to figure out. Yeah, because zip codes can also be very big. Um, like I live in 2215, and there are some low income areas around, because Baltimore is always good neighborhoods surrounded by. A good a bad word. Oh, sorry, that was bad. Like <laughs> higher income neighborhoods surrounded by low income neighborhoods. So, you know, so it's kind of difficult to figure that out. But we are looking for ways to provide access because that is important that people can't see stories then. Yeah. But we have a paywall because we also need the revenue to survive. So yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's that push and pull between yeah. how do we provide the information that people need and also make sure that people who need it can actually get it. Right. Yes. Right. And there's a, and I don't think this is so, so remote to that. And I think also, obviously, every news organization, depending on their model, functions and looks a little bit differently. But it's thinking about, you know, so that the Marshall Project, we did this project in Cleveland about, um, people cycling through the court systems. And we've had a lot of conversation about, well, a big part of the journalism we're trying to do and the service oriented part of that journalism is information that people who are leaving incarceration need to have. And so what does it, and so should we literally print it out and have it be handed to them in their packet as they're released? 
um, is it important to make sure that there that this information is available at the public defender's office or at the courthouse, right? Like it's thinking about how do we put this information in front of people and not making the assumption that anyone who might need this information has the money and means to get to it, right? Because again, you would think about who that then privileges as your reader and who you're imagining your reader is, right? One of the tells I always say is like, if you read political coverage, does it say when the election is or not? Like literally one day. Because if it doesn't, you're making a specific assumption about who's reading it. You're not actually writing a story for voters or for people who might not. You're making you're it, just you're, writing it for the person you beat on the story. Correct. <laughs> you're writing it for your colleagues and your sources and for the other gilded elites, right? Who, why would you be to tell me what day the election is, right? Or are you writing it to inform the masses who might go, oh, this is interesting. I do care about this. Yeah, I hate that guy or that person's, yeah, I should show up and vote. Wait, when is this again? I mean, oh, yeah. March 4th. Oh, but, and again, I, having come out of political journalism, I, I would, once you start looking for that, you'll become enraged by how you never find it in any pieces ever. Right. Lots of politics reporting, no details about when the elections are <laughs> or how to vote in them. I, was, I just want to say one thing. So this issue has come up with one of our neighborhood reporters who covers um, some of the neighborhoods as large Latino populations. And that's one of her concerns. So she's writing these stories, but they're all in English. And mm. are they, you know, are they really helping? Because she's doing some useful stories like access to my, like she did a story recently about how there's not enough bilingual employees in the city. So when, um, Gastric was trying to get services, you know, it, it takes them a while because of that. But her concern has been, well, they can't read my story. So yeah, so it's something, it's something that we're working on. Yeah. yeah, it's it's the difference between, you know, thinking about your news consumers versus your services. Yeah, it's like, who are you here to serve? It's, uh, it's an important distinction. I mean, the whole paywall question is, uh, is fraught because Obviously, we have to figure out how to pay for these things, but um, if it's a public service, it's, it, needs to, it needs to get to the people who need it. Um, other things? One and then two. Um, again, I'll reiterate. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, I know we talked a little bit about like covering violence today, and you two are covering locally two large cities, Baltimore and LA, and that deal with a lot of violence. So I'm wondering from a newsroom perspective, how do you decide what stories get told with this stuff? You know, you only have amount of people going out and reporting. How do you decide what can get covered and what you can sort of amount to cover? Go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a tough question because it's not an exact science and it can change day by day. I can tell you if our crime coverage that we made a deliberate de deliberate decision not to just do briefs on shootings because they don't tell you anything, um, and it just makes it it's just just makes it look like I mean there is violence in the city, but it just makes it look like look like it's just all violence and you're not giving any context or perspective. So we try to do the broader stories through the shootings if that makes sense. And another thing that um, we have done is we've hired two data reporters. Um, so that way we can do the data analysis, um, you know, to, to back up the reporting, to tell the bigger picture story. So you're not just doing like individual shooting stories. Um, like they're working on a story on, um, well, maybe I shouldn't say. Because I haven't heard it yet, but, <laughs> um, but, but, but yeah, using data to, to tell the bigger picture story rather than, you know, just cover the data issues. I mean, part of what you're dealing with in, in this situation is um, shootings are an important local story mm -hmm. because it tells you about what's happening in the community. The question is, um, if you're doing it in briefs or on blotter, is it really telling you anything you don't know? Um, and so, while I think, I mean, the idea of making sure we cover that kind of thing because it's, it's, it is about the life of the, every, every shooting death is about the life of a community. Um, 
but we have to tell it that way. It's it's not just you know somebody over there shooting up at somebody else. Something happened in your community that's important to you, and um, we got to figure out a way to solve it. Well, and I, and I think that we have to you know the journalism is is needs to be a value add, right? And so the way I think about it is if Look, my neighbors who are obsessed with knowing about every little crime that happens in our neighborhood already know. The newspaper doesn't have to tell them that. They got like seven apps and they email us all about them. Yeah. Right? That there's not some high-minded journalistic function of, I rewrote these three sentences from the police to say that there was a stabbing and no one knows who was stabbed, but here I wrote it in the newspaper, right? It's just democracy will not stop happening if that doesn't occur. History will not not know that anyone was stabbed. It's all over the internet. Right. Our job is to contextualize and add information. One of the things I note about, well, one, one of the examples I always give is that if, you know, someone is stabbed in my block in Northeast tonight, tonight, it'll be written about in brief by every news organization in Washington. And then three months from now, when someone goes to trial for the stabbing, there'll be not a single reporter in the room. So when all the people involved under oath provide all of the detail of what happened, we will not care enough to show up and write those details down. That we will cover the stabbing when we don't even know if the person lived or died or what their name was, much less why they were stabbed, right? And it exposes the lie to the importance of, well, like, well, it's so important for us to, well, we do the vast majority of our journalism when the least amount of information is available. I never follow up when all the information is available. And I think that more often we have to reset our journalism. I have a friend who, who I stole this from, who he talks about how a lot of journalists want to be the first person to write about something and his desire is to be the last person to write about something, right? That we want to do our- He still have a job. He does. <laughs> Doesn't write very often. <laughs> but the, um, yes, you know, it, but, I, but I think that that is, but I do think that's important, right? Again, I do a lot of work that relies on court transcripts and other work like that, that where on these stories where everyone cared about them for 42 seconds and that all this information was available and none of that information ever entered the public record because no one ever went back and looked. And I think that, and I think that that's how we can do journalism that sits and breathes in the nuances a little bit more that helps us actually contextualize, that helps us actually hear from everyone. Well, if I, I mean, what ends up happening is we write this brief about the stabbing and it immediately becomes political Play-Doh for everybody. And we don't actually have any idea what drove this stabbing, if where this person came from, what role mental illness or drug, we don't know. You know when we will know? in like three months when there's a whole trial about this. And so we could just wait and write about that. But we don't, we'll write about it in two sentences and then everyone on Ted Cruz will yell about it on the internet and it'll be a whole thing, right? And I think we have to think about, you know, how do we service our democracy? And it's by providing as much information, as much context and about not providing contextless things out into the ether so that have people project onto them. One more. I uh, might be two more. <laughs> Tony and then. Um, so you were talking about um, like having like a diversified revenue plan. And you were talking about like the inherent risks of philanthropy or like the possible risks of philanthropy. How like, is it viable to eventually have lean off philanthropy at like these nonprofit based places and get back to kind of subscriptions and ads? Is that just something that comes with trust as you like build trust in those communities and get more subscriptions? Yeah, um, no, I mean, we actually think, of, you know, I believe it's too that it has to be double revenue streams because you can't ever depend on one. I mean, just like in your own personal life, you shouldn't put all your investments in one yeah. side, you should be diversified. So I think it's the same, you know, the same thing with the, with, with, you know, the revenue model with as well. Yeah. You never know. I mean, advertising is just not what it used to be. I mean, you can like direct market. I mean, I get emails every day about sales. So, you know, advertising is just not the same, but there are still ways that advertising can be useful. So that's why I think it has to be like several streams, not just one, but he makes a good point. You don't know, you're still, you are still involved with the people who have money. I mean. <laughs> right, and they yeah, all decide, yeah. you know, their I mean, politics yeah. are what they are now, and they, they yeah. are, the economy's been good for a long time. And yeah. so spend, and it's like, I don't, I don't trust these rich people. Like, yeah. not like that, right? Right, right. You know, like, right. And, we, and, we, and we keep it separate, but you never, I mean, you never know when 
Yeah. You get the last question. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I think something that kind of came up in my head while you guys were talking is kind of how do we get these local stories like the murder murders and the Idaho killings? Like, how do those become local issues that somehow become national? Like, are, is it because it's sensationalized and, you know, we're like a true crime, like we all want to solve the murders, but like, it feels like some stories pop out in national news more than others when, I mean, really like the Murdoch murders is like a local issue and it affects the most people at a local level. Um, I think that that's something that comes up in my head a lot. Like how does, how does that happen? I'm going to, I'm going to take that one. I think it is what we talked about. That is, that is a commodity. That is a news commodity that people know will sell. And so wherever you are, you decide to take it. And that's how, you know, we end up looking at that on TV for weeks at a time. I think probably the story I heard here today that feels like the most important kind of local story is the one you talked about the accidents on Orleans Street that everybody who uses that knows about it. And then you guys figured out what was going on, explained it, quantified it, and contextualize it. And then it's like, okay, we live here and we know something more about uh, our community. Um, and we should just do more of those. Yeah, I mean, not to, not to be on Marx, but like, but it's the <laughs> truth, right? It's that, it's that all of, all of us are supposedly or theoretically are in the most like high-minded version of ourselves providing this like public service that is completely at the whims of the masses and what they will pay money for. Yeah. That is not a very good means of doing the public service, right? And so it's like, wait, they care about these like Idaho college girls getting murdered? More stories on that. Like who cares that there's lead in the water and that like the fish are dying and the world is ending, but like, wait, but those girls got murdered by that weirdo. Like do more on that, right? Again, the story that affects no one except for those four families, right? And it's terrible for them. Um, Traffic and weather. The, the fact that I know anything about a murder that happened in Idaho, right? It speaks to the way all of this operates, right? I do think that that's, you know, we, we get, end up in the spot where we're forced to give the readers what they want and what the readers show us that they want over and over again is flaming garbage. And <laughs> what the hope is, I'm going to be the hopeful one. The hope is <laughs> 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 don't your new site with those stories and we'll see all your other great stories. <laughs> we, we, can't, we can't stop us. <laughs> we just keep going. We just keep going. Um, Thank you very much. This was uh, really terrific. I hope you guys had as much fun as we did. And uh, come back and do it again. Thank you, Terrence, Andrea, Wes, uh, everybody. Thank you for coming. There are a couple more opportunities to hear from Terrence this semester. Uh, be sure to go to your flyer and uh, do some research. A month from today. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.